Welcome back, DP Review TV viewers. It is Jordan Drake here to give you my full review of the photo and video capabilities of the Canon EOS R7, which I'm not holding right now because Chris is filming me on it. So you get an idea of the 4K oversampled video quality, as well as my final thoughts on this camera. Okay, so why am I doing this review instead of Chris? Well, it's because I brought the EOS R7 on a family vacation and used it exclusively to shoot all my photos and video on the trip. And you abandoned me. I, you know what? I needed to get away from him for a moment. So let's go talk about this camera. All right, so first off with the handling on this camera, it really feels like kind of an amalgamation of everything Canon's been doing with their R-series bodies. And there's a lot I really like. I love the grip on this. It's very comfortable, even with larger lenses. And I like that they've added an autofocus, manual focus selector switch with a custom button. What I found really useful is I set the custom button there to be my punch in focus. So when I switch from autofocus to manual focus for like a macro or something, hit the button, I'm ready to go. My fingers are already there. It works great. But it's not all great on this. For starters, we've got a new hybrid autofocus joystick slash exposure compensation dial on the back of it, and I was constantly adjusting whichever setting I didn't mean to. Adjusting my exposure, I'm bumping my autofocus point, moving my autofocus point, suddenly my exposure is all screwed up. Happened constantly, and I never really got used to it. As well, I like that they've changed that the camera on and off switch is no longer on the left side of the body, so you know if you're holding the lens with your hand, you can still turn the camera on and off but they put the video selector switch on the same dial and I found all the time I was turning the camera on to take a photograph and it would be in video mode. It got pretty irritating pretty fast. And finally, if your camera has a mode dial on it, especially like a semi-pro body like this, put a lock on it. The number of times I had the camera in manual mode, pulled it out of my bag and I'm shooting in bulb mode. Well, it was more than once and that's enough to really piss me off. Okay, next let's talk about the displays on the R7, starting with the EVF, and this is where I wish there was an upgrade over the lower level R10. They both have the same 2.36 million dot electronic viewfinder, and that's pretty underwhelming for a $1,500 camera. I mean, look at the Nikon Z5, that's less money, it's a full frame camera, and it has a 3.69 million dot EVF, and it's not just a numbers game. When I was doing things like manually focusing during video, I was really struggling to keep the subjects in focus. I wish this was a sharper display. The LCD, on the other hand, I really don't have much to complain about with it. It is a 1.62 million dot display. It's nice and bright, it's very clear, and it has a very responsive touchscreen interface. Next up is autofocus, and we were actually really impressed with how the R7 performed when we were doing our initial review in Florida shooting sports and wildlife, but there's some modes we weren't able to test. And the biggest one for me is the vehicle detection on this. Now, lots of other cameras from other manufacturers offer vehicle detection. This has a cool trick up its sleeve. Just like the R3, it has something called spot detection. It is a horrible name. You have no idea what that actually means. But what it does do is it will try and find the driver of whatever vehicle you've got and focus on their face or their helmet. And you can toggle that on and off if you don't want it focusing on the driver. I went and shot a go-kart track with it and it worked flawlessly the entire time. I mean, yes, these things aren't the most demanding subjects out there, but it did not budge off the helmet. Was very impressed. For the rest of my vacation, I really kind of leaned on the tracking autofocus modes, and the interface is very similar to what we saw in the Professional R3, but because this sensor reads out much slower, you can't expect the same kind of hit rate with that, but it is still very good. But it's, it's not infallible. When I was shooting wakeboarding, I found that the camera was constantly trying to focus on the tow rope, not the actual wakeboarder in those situations, but going into the menu, switching it to case mode two, where it'll ignore foreground subjects, fix the issue. So it's a very capable autofocus system, but you might need to hold its hand once in a while to get the best out of it. Another thing we weren't able to test in Florida was how the autofocus tracking would work when using older EF lenses with an adapter. So I grabbed the old 85mm f1.8 EF lens, which has a fairly speedy USM motor in it. And there I found my hit rate when using eye detection drop dramatically, often front or back focused. So it does mean this is compatible with a lot of older EF lenses, but some of those aren't gonna be able to keep up with the very sophisticated autofocus on the R7. Your mileage will vary and I would definitely test all your EF lenses. All right, next up, let's talk about image quality. And you might be looking at the frame right now saying, dear God, this is the best image quality I've ever seen from a camera ever, but that's, don't be fooled. That's just because there's a handsome devil presenting. So let's talk about photo quality first. And Canon made a big deal about the fact that this was a new sensor in the R7, not the one we'd already seen in the 90D or the M6 Mark II, but looking at the raw files, 
you're not really seeing much of a difference there at all. However, when we compare the JPEGs from this to the older 90D, there you can see there is way more detail, and that has to be because of the more modern processor in the R7. If you mostly shoot JPEGs, you are seeing a nice image quality bump here. Looking at the high ISO RAW files, you can see that it's just not quite as clean as what we're seeing from the absolute best BSI APS-C competition. As far as dynamic range is concerned, this is very competitive with other APS-C cameras. When you bring up the shadows, you will see a little bit of noise there, but in a very high contrast shot like this one here, we can recover a useful amount of shadow information and I'm pretty happy with the results. Finally, I just get to relax and talk about video. It's so much easier, and most of what I said in my initial review still stands. I really love the fact that we get oversampled 4K up to 30 frames per second. What I didn't mention in the previous video is the rolling shutter in those oversampled modes is actually really quite bad. You can see a lot of that jello effect, and if you're planning to do a lot of fast pans or shoot a lot with telephoto lenses, this can be a real issue. Now, it does give you the option to shoot subsampled up to 4K 60 or in any of the 1080 modes. There, the rolling shutter is dramatically reduced, but then you're going to be having less detailed, noisier footage. The choice is yours. Hey, let's vlog! For vlogging, the R7 looks like a really compelling option on paper. I mean, we've got in-body image stabilization, phase detect autofocus, headphone jack, microphone jack, and in practice, it is an excellent vlogging tool. My main concern with it is just the lenses, I mean, there's an 18 to 45 or the 18 to 150, neither of them are giving you much on the wide angle. And remember, this is actually a 1.6 crop instead of the 1.5 crop that we see on the other APS-C models out there. So Canon really needs to bring out a compact, ultra-wide lens, and then they're going to have one of the best vlogging cameras out there. For the time being, you're just going to have to adapt EF lenses, most likely, and that will impact the autofocus performance. But if you're into vlogging and you got the glass for it, the R7's a great choice. All right, overheating. I was very concerned when we were shooting in Florida because it was insanely hot and I was filming the entire episode on an R7 in the oversampled mode and I didn't run into any overheating issues. The camera never even got warm in my hand, but I wanted to do a more controlled test. So in room temperature, put it in the oversampled 4K at 30 frames per second. This is gonna be the most demanding on the camera in terms of temperature. And it recorded for an hour and a half. I didn't have a warning on it. The base plate got slightly warm, but nothing I'd be concerned about. And I got really bored and I stopped doing the overheat test. So for most applications, I don't think overheating is gonna be a real problem for you. That being said, if you're shooting in extremely hot environments, just switch over to the subsampled record modes. And again, I don't think you're gonna to have to worry about overheating, those should be even better controlled. After spending quite a bit of time with the R7, I think it's a camera that could make sense for a lot of people, especially if you're looking for a relatively inexpensive body that has pro-grade autofocus. And certainly the focus on this will outperform the Fujifilm X-T4, and I'd even give it an edge over the Sony A6600, especially if you're gonna take advantage of some of those vehicle tracking modes and animal detect options. My biggest problem with this is just the lens mount on it. Currently we have two dedicated APS-C RF lenses, a couple of slow zooms there, and the rest of the RF lens lineup doesn't really make a ton of sense, both financially and practically, if you're gonna slap it on an APS-C body. If Canon does bring out a series of compact APS-C RF mount primes and a small RF telephoto, then I think this camera is gonna be a much more compelling option. And absolutely, I know that you can use the EF adapter and put some of those older lenses on there, but as I discovered, the performance just isn't that consistent and you're not getting the best out of the very impressive autofocus this camera can offer. As well, we recently did an episode looking at some of the best hybrid cameras out there, things that excel at taking photos and recording video, and the R7 placed very well. It's really good at both pursuits and if you're the kind of person to shoot photos and video a lot, this is again a very compelling option. So hopefully this review helped you decide if the R7 is the right camera for you, but we're not done yet because I took photographs where you push the button and it makes a clicky sound and it's like video but nothing moves and I put all of those for you in a sample gallery that you can find on dpreview.com. Go check those out, you can download the raw files, play with them yourself. Also, be sure to subscribe to DP Review TV for more episodes, including Chris's solo R10 review that he shot while I was on vacation. You know what? Follow us on like the social media things that are on the bottom now or were earlier. You should check those out. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again soon with more DP Review TV. So let's spend a little time talking about some of the handling on this camera. 
Uh, that was my family that just rolled right behind me, uh, the ones that I am neglecting right now. Feeling pretty bad about that. 